Greetings, everybody. Hello, Houston. Well, I'll kick things off. We had a little, little, a little pre-show there for a few minutes, uh, so some of you may have uh, uh, seen some of that. So, just uh, so uh, a warm welcome. So, uh, so, my name is Adam Hems, and uh, you are watching the live stream of the uh, Houston Azure User Group. Uh, February edition, uh, one week delayed uh, for I think those of us here in Houston uh, will know very well why that is. Um, hope everyone made it uh, through the freeze uh, with minimal damage. I don't know, I, I know so many people with, as all, all of you I'm sure, with broken pipes, that's the worst nightmare, who had days without power and the grocery stores are still recovering, the ones here in Katy still short on food, but uh, you know, I think the city seems to be getting back to normal. Um, you know, DoorDash is back online, and uh, it'll, we've had steady power and internet for a little while since. And uh, the grocery stores are recovering, so we made it. Uh, that wasn't that much fun. It wasn't for us. I'm sure it wasn't for any of you. Um, but uh, yeah, so we made it. And here in Katie, my wife and I, we had we were fortunate at the most no broken no broken pipes uh, on our end. So we were lucky, uh, relatively, in a mere 14 hours of no power. So that was pretty short compared to to most continuous rather than blackouts. So I know everyone else has those uh, those same stories and challenges. So. I don't know about everyone else, but I saw a meme from a colleague around getting pretty tired of living through these once in a lifetime events. There's, there's too many of these. Had enough of these for one lifetime. Thanks. I'm pr pretty sure many of you can can relate. So anyway, so a one week uh, delayed uh, presentation of uh, of our user group uh, this evening. Um, really warm welcome. Uh, there are some folks I know that uh, are here for the for the first time. So uh, a little bit uh, about the group before I, I introduce uh, our speaker uh, this evening. Um, and while I do that, um, uh, I put in the chat. We'd love to know where we have a, a Q and A open. Um, there should be. Um, uh, a um, uh, if you have, should have the Q and A open, and we'd love to know whereabouts in Houston are you? And yes, you know, virtual. So there might be some folks, and there has been previously, uh, who have uh, joined us from uh, outside of Houston. And if so, a very warm welcome. Love to have you here. Unusual in that uh, uh, we uh, get uh, folks coming from out of town, but uh, we, yeah. So let us let us know if you're in, if you're in town. Whereabouts are in town? Uh, I, I'm here uh, here in Katy. I know there are some of my some of my neighbours. I'm sure who are watching here tonight. So uh, let us know if you are hi if you are hi neighbours. Um, uh, about this group. So um, I've been leading this group for around nearly. I think this has been my sixth year. So I was thinking about it. it must have been like 50 or so of these. We've had them uh, presentations pretty much once every month. Pretty much missed a couple at the end of last year actually. So December didn't happen. But I try to make up for it. We had a couple at two in one month earlier in the earlier in the year. So. Uh, a lot of presentations and so um, uh, often uh, and some of the best ones are from members of the community, some of whom I know have, uh, have uh, tuned in this evening uh, to join us. Great to see you all. Uh, and also from my colleagues. My, my day job is as a cloud architect uh, with Microsoft and this is sort of my hobby. Um, but, uh, one of the uh, intents uh, of th this group is, is around uh, community. I see some some folks uh, um, kind of putting there like a Midtown, Magnolia, Sugarland. I'm just going to publish those uh, so that everyone can see them while they come in. Nice to see you all uh, where you all are. So the intent of this is this group is yeah very much around community. If you're here for a sales pitch, absolutely 100% the wrong place. Uh, this is not what this is about. Ordinarily, of course, in pre-COVID times, like I was saying, this is. Uh, um, very much we meet, you know, we met in a few different physical locations, usually actually in the Microsoft Office, because that's sort of convenient for most people. And we've tried a few different locations. We've tried downtown a couple of times, but uh, yeah, usually in the Microsoft Office um, uh, in city center here in town, and nice, you know, lots of room, things like that, get lots of food in. Um, and those, uh, those are a bit fun times. I really miss that. 
I really miss it. Um, and uh, the intent really is uh, so that we can just meet one another and learn from one another because the technology is the same, um, but the problems we're looking to solve with the technology vary quite a bit um, and yet have some similarities. And folks from different size companies, one person to some of the largest organizations, of course, in the world are based here in Houston, um, all different industries, uh, we've got a lot of oil and gas, obviously, but also got a lot of healthcare, a lot of finance folks, uh, a lot of go some government folks as well, often come and show up and join us. So it's a, it's a broad mixture. Um, and so the intent of this group is just to give an opportunity for everyone to, to learn from one another, as well as uh, from, from the speaker. None of the uh, technologies we speak about are um, usually uh, uh, anything that's uh, you know groundbreaking or uh, you know um, reveal for the first time or anything. That'll be actually next week. Uh, Microsoft Ignite is next week. You'll see some new stuff there. Um, not in these presentations. It's really uh, often experiences with various uh, Azure technologies, how to learn them, and an invitation usually to uh, uh, discuss uh, these the learnings uh, with, the, with the speaker. Um, uh, normally, we, uh, in fact, uh, generally speaking, ban um, uh, any kind of virtual uh, uh, aspect to these events. Azure has no shortage of technology to allow us to stream these, of course. Uh, we, uh, we don't do that because uh, we'd like to encourage uh, folks to, to come in and uh, meet one another and uh, and, and chat if, if they want. And we'd like to see folks. Uh, we've had folks come in from out of town as a result of that. I had some folks come in from Austin uh, more than once, which uh, um, yeah, made me feel slightly bad <laughs> that I denied them, that I made them do that. But anyway, it was, it was nice to see them and it works. In these COVID times, we've uh, gone all virtual, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the way of it, I think uh, has, has the speaker Hassan and I were chatting about that. Yeah, it's been over a year for us, each of us now. So getting really used to it, but uh, nonetheless, um, in the spirit of um, uh, collaboration and uh, and community, uh, we're not recording this. This is this is live. So saying live from Katie. Hi, and uh, Hassan's live from Ohio, Ohio, Ohio. I'll introduce him in just a minute. Um, so. Uh, you can't go back and record this, you know, you can't catch the recording later or anything like that. So it's interactive in real time, uh, as close really to a, you know, an in-person event uh, as we can get. That's the intent. So uh, like I say, Q&A uh, should be open. Um, and so we invite you to, to uh, put your questions uh, in there. Um, we're going to go for an um, hour, and, hour and a half, hour, hour and a half, something like that. We'll see, depending on you know how many questions we have. Um, oh, someone came from Dallas. Ah, greetings, greetings from all the way up north in Dallas. Uh, welcome, thank you for for, for joining us. It's, it's good to see you. We saved you the drive today. Um, and uh, our speaker is from out of town, like I, like I say, which uh, we've had that a few times in the past. Uh, we've had speakers. We always make them fly in. Obviously, <laughs> we did once have them uh we did a, we did a virtual speaker once and in person and it actually didn't work out that great so didn't don't do that again um uh, so we've always made them fly in so uh, speakers from out of town are not, not unusual uh, but uh, today's speaker is uh, is from ohio uh, so with that let me uh, introduce you to uh, hassan hassan you i put your camera up live now so everyone can see you uh, please uh, please introduce yourself and uh, your, your content this evening yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Hassan Sauran. I am from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, and I speak about Azure SQL Edge with you today. And I don't work for Microsoft. I'm a Microsoft uh, platform, the data platform MVP. So this is going to be mostly about kind of my adventure, how I actually install Azure SQL Edge on Raspberry Pi. So I will try to answer any of your questions, but as I said before, this is gonna kind of give you the story of how I learn. Uh, there are a lot of technologies involved in this that you have to know. So I'm gonna try to share my story with you today. And yeah, thank you for uh, coming to listen to me. Okay, sounds good. Um, I can put your content up. Let me uh, just get your video up. Um, Okay, I've got your screen, your screen up again, Hassan. If you uh, okay, want to, uh, yep, 
Yeah, we can see that. Sounds good. So, uh, so as I said before, you know, I'm going to talk the SQL Edge. So here's our agenda today, and I'm going to start with first. Uh, I'm going to try to give you an explanation of IoT because not everybody knows what IoT is, and I'm going to give you some stats where we were before and where we are now. And I'm going to do that mostly for to show you the opportunities that you know IoT actually gave us and how much you know it might change your you know career if you will try to go this way. I actually talk about this for a SQL Server when it came to 2017. Linux version was a huge hit, right? So everybody was kind of asking, okay, where are we going with this Linux version? So now actually, when the SQL Edge comes up, it kind of makes more sense because there's a great opportunity here for everybody to learn. And there's a lot of IoT devices out there, which I will cover in here. And then we will go and look at some of the other technologies that you kind of need to be familiar with if you want to you know, use a SQL Edge, like we have to know the Azure IoT Hub. You need to know the containers, you need to know Linux. And we are going to go you know, step by step, and I'm going to try to kind of give you, a, I guess, a story here. So. And here is my contact information. You can follow me from any of those uh, platforms. If you will have any kind of questions later, you can uh, reach me from there. And I have my blog. I write my usually C Sharp, Cosmos DB, Azure, I share whatever I know. So you might find something interesting out there for, uh, if you like. And currently I am a business intelligence manager at Progressive Insurance. And that's my second year as a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I'm very happy and proud. So let's start with history. Uh, IoT is not really that new. Like many things came up uh, in you know 80s and 90s, many cool things actually. IoT is one of them. And they didn't call it IoT then. It was I think they called it connected devices. And idea was there but technology was not, and it was expensive. I remember my first computer, it was 90s, it was like 286, then 286 came up, 386 came up, 486 came up, and it wasn't cheap. And those machines were pretty huge. And there was no way that we were able to, I guess, use the technology and create small IoT devices with those. So we kind of, idea came up on, you know, 70, 80, 90, but we had to wait for some of the, almost like the key points to actually come up, like turning points. The first turning point was probably, I would say 2010s, the chips, CPUs start to get cheaper. And, you know, the hardware start to get smaller. So that was the first thing we had to wait for. Second thing we had to wait for was the communication. And we couldn't just, you know, hardwire all of these IoT devices. So we had to wait that wife, you know, Wi-Fi had to come and be a common communication in anywhere. So we had to wait for Wi-Fi, and I would say probably that's the 2010s too. And but the biggest turning point that we kind of had to wait was uh, IPv6 revolution. Before that, there was no way that we were able to actually get uh, you know IP addresses because the with IPv4, as you can see, the maximum you can get is the 4.3 billion. IP addresses in the work light. And that was a big kind of like a bottleneck. And we had to wait, I think, for 2011 for IPv6 to come up. So those were the kind of the turning points for IoT to be, I guess, a big uh, game changer. And IoT actually name came up, I think it was 1999. It was Kevin Anderson came with that, the Internet of the Things, uh, one of his presentation. So he came up with the name. So if you look at the first IoT device, you might be surprised. It was 1982. And one of the universities, actually, they connected one of the POC machines to their uh, network. And they put one sensor in it. And that sensor was just responsible for one thing, which was just checking the temperatures of the uh, drinks in it. So they were sharing. So that was really the first IoT device in it. Then, we had to wait eight more years for John Ramke to connect his toaster to the internet by using the TCP IP protocol. 
So he was really excited and he had a lot of kind of, uh, you know, articles about it. The only thing really you can do was you can just control the minutes, how many uh, minutes is going to actually keep the breath inside. But it was getting controlled by TCP IP and it was going to go to the internet. So it was very exciting for those days. Uh, then 1991 comes up. That's the first web camera. And it was in another university and I believe it was the University of Cambridge. And well, the, the, all the students, everybody needed coffee, right? And the problem was when they go to the web, there was the, the coffee machine was always empty. So they say, okay, you know, let's put one camera here and that camera will take the pictures of this uh, coffee pot, maybe every five, 10 minutes, and it will send them to them. So whenever the coffee pot goes down, they go and make more coffee. So that was really the first web camera and first almost like IoT device because it was just taking pictures and sending them. So that was 1991. Then we had to wait nine more years for this complex internet connected refrigerator. This was from MOG. And it was really a complex machine for 2000. It could even do like video calls. You could even shop online. And it can, it had cameras inside. It can, you can actually see, you know, the, what you need. It can figure it out. And it was 2000. It failed big. The main reason was, well, people really didn't need it in 2000, a complex machine like that. And also it was very expensive. It was $20,000 refrigerator. And there's no way I'm paying $20,000 to a refrigerator. So it failed bad. So what is really an IoT device? The IoT device is really, we have like a board, right? And we have a couple of sensors on that board. And this device sensing something, and then we are just sharing this data to somebody. And there's a lot of possibilities here. In our case, uh, we are going to actually try to use the Raspberry Pi. And you can actually buy any kind of sensors for Raspberry Pi. You can just put it on the board. And then you are going to need to write some kind of code which is going to use the sensor and get the data and push to maybe Azure IoT Hub or keep them in the SQL Server in the Raspberry Pi in some way. So that gives a lot of possibilities for you know, companies. Companies love IoT devices because they can catch the problem before it happens. So for example, you can put a sensor in a car and might just you know, watch the temperature of the engine. And if it's getting like higher and higher, maybe you need to do something about this before it kind of blows up. So you can do all kinds of stuff with this. So there are a lot of devices up there. Some of them are useful, some of them is totally useless. So for example, you know, we had the uh, smart doorbells, you know, somebody comes to your uh, door and it kind of detects somebody and it just gives you a warning. Or, you know, you have those speakers, uh, you can just talk to them and they will do, they will order things for you. They will do all kind of amazing stuff. And it's one of my favorite is the thermostat, right? At night thermostat, uh, it just puts it down and when everybody is sleeping, it cools down. When you wake up, the heat's up. So, those are nice things to actually have. They are useful. But there are a lot of useless stuff out there too. For example, one of the items out there is the smart form. So the, all it does is it just kind of watches how fast you eat your food. And if you are eating food too fast, it starts to kind of shake and lights up and try to kind of control, I guess, how fast you are eating your food. I don't know about you, but that's the last thing I need in my life that my you know, food is kind of shaking my uh, mouth when I was trying to eat. The second thing out there is a smart thing. It's a shirt or a sweater, something like that. So it kind of listens what's happening around and it kind of changes what's thrown up, but there's a, almost like a kind of uh, lights out there. It changes. I don't know. It's kind of useless to me. I don't know about you, but. And another example out there, there's a smart salter. It kind of tried to watch how much salt you eat in a day. And some people lost it, but you know what? Those Amazon dash buttons, I don't see them like anything, anything useful. I have kids here, you know, if I can just leave those Amazon, Amazon dash buttons, when you click on it, it's supposed to go and order something for you. That's the last thing in my, you know, I have three kids here, they can just go crazy on it and it can order all kinds of stuff for me. Also, my wife has one of those Bluetooth toothbrushes. I never kind of connect that Bluetooth and figure out what it actually does. 
but it kind of sometimes it lights up and all kinds of stuff. So I don't even know what it does. And also there are some other stuff here in adult industry. They're not even going to go out there. There's all kinds of stuff that you will kind of you'll hear it. If you listen to it, it will go probably crazy because I cannot share them here. But there's all kind of stories out there too. So if you look at how actual IoT devices are, you know, growing, as I said before, in 2011, um, somewhere here, probably, that was the time that we changed from IPv4 and IPv6. And IPv6 led us to have many IoT devices because we don't have any more limits. So now in 2020, you can see this, everything's going up. And this number, when you look at here, is almost 50. Actually, the number is here is 50.1 billion IoT devices are on Earth in 2020. It's not million, it's billion, which is a crazy number. And if you, let's actually look at this graph in a little bit different. On Earth in 2020, we are expecting to have 7.6 billion people, but we have 50 billion IoT devices. And it was almost like 2005 to IoT devices actually catch us in this time. And according to this number, we almost have seven IoT devices in every house, which is, I'm guessing that's probably bigger than that because, you know, not every country has IoT devices, not every country has internet. So probably that number higher than six. That's my guess. This almost kind of sounds like to me the Skynet, right? That, those things are out there, right now, and I'm hoping we will keep them under control because I, every day I see all kind of crazy stuff. Those drones are going crazy. You know, they have they put guns on them and all kind of stuff. It's like it's a joke, but you know, it's a possibility one day with that many devices. Can you imagine like you get out of control 50 billion devices? It's crazy. Uh, so let's look at some of the actually devices we have. So if you are gonna actually Use the SQL Edge. It's probably going to be one of those uh, devices you might want to kind of install and do something with it. So those are for the household items. Uh, the biggest one is the smartphone. Everybody has a smartphone. And if, but if you look at other stuff, smart speakers, that's a good one. And we have smart watches. Imagine you can install uh, SQL Server on smart watch. What can you do with that? So there's a lot of possibilities here. Uh, also, we have the bigger project centers, and those are mostly like the global fair of IoT for like larger industries. The biggest one here is the smart city, and you know most of the city is really uh, investing a lot of money on that because they are going to save a lot of money with that. So, for example, New York is one of them. In here, there's Columbus in Ohio. There's they are one of the smart cities in the United States. So, what they really do mostly is, for example, they have smart park which help drivers to find the empty space and pay digitally. Or they can change the pattern of the traffic depending, you know, you have the cameras and they can change the lights pretty easily and try to you know, open the traffic. And there's like uh, in market, for example, there's like smart retail, which tracks the inventory on the shelves and it warns the manager if the product is actually getting low. So they can order more. So there's all kind of stuff out there that you can uh, you can do with IoT devices in big industries. So the biggest, I guess, the, whenever you are doing the architecture for this, you need to decide how your actual IoT device is going to connect and share the data. Uh, as today, we have three options. The perfect network connectivity option will be probably consuming extremely little power and you will have a huge range and you will be able to transmit large amount of data. Well, that will be a perfect network, but this doesn't exist today. So if your device is trying to share a lot of data, probably you are going to go with the first option. here, And this is for the high power consumption. Uh, there's a huge high range and there's a high bandwidth. This is great. But it's expensive. Uh, what we can give an example for that is probably your cell phones. So your cell phones, you can reach anywhere on the earth and you can share videos, you can share all kinds of stuff with it. It's expensive and also it needs a lot of power. 
So that's why you have to charge it every day. Uh, the second option you have is you need low power. The range is lower and it has a high bandwidth. And the best example for that is the you know, wireless and Bluetooth. And probably that's the most common one because it's cheaper than having you know, a SIM card in every IoT device. And in here, really, all you need is you need to uh, like have a wireless network. And as long as real IoT devices are in it, you should be able to use that. And that's why it's probably common. And the third one, uh, which probably I really haven't heard about it before I started actually this presentation, is a low power wide area network. And it doesn't need that much power. It has a high range, but it has a low, low bandwidth. And the best example for that is the agriculture. So, for example, the farmers, there are like IoT devices, watch, watches the, maybe the temperature of the soil. Right? So the data you are going to share is not big and that the data doesn't change that much either. So in that case, you can use the IP1 on them. It's much cheaper and you are able to actually transmit that maybe a couple of miles from the IoT device to the, you know, where we are trying to send it. So IP1 is working great if the data we are trying to share is not damaged and it does it doesn't change that much so one of the challenges of iot devices is the security as i said before you know the iot devices are not really that powerful hardware first of all so they might not be strong enough to actually put you know advanced security features encryption and other stuff on it so that's one of the problems and other, other problem is, you know, people like to just put, you know, hard code the default passwords out there and forget about it. Uh, there's not that much you can do about it, especially if your company, let's say you have 10,000 IoT devices and they're all over the place and in very remote places. So you really cannot connect with each of them and try to change the passwords. So that's one of the problems that, you know, you will have for sure with the IoT devices. That's where Azure IoT Hub actually comes in. So let's say your company is, you know, using all these IoT devices. The last thing probably you want is you want those IoT devices to connect to your data center, right? You might have hundreds of today, but next month or the next year, you might have thousands of them. So is, are you going to be capable to actually get all this data? And you are going to be responsible 100% for that. So Azure IoT Hub is actually offering you a central place that all these IoT devices will kind of connect to and they can send the messages to IoT Hub. And also, that's a central place for you to actually go and set, send the signals back to those IoT devices. So for any reason, you need to update something in the device, IoT Hub, uh, and let's say you have 1,000 IoT Hubs, with one click, you can actually send, the, send messages to 1,000 devices. So that makes it really uh, nice and central. Uh, it's reliable and secure. You're in Azure. That means that all data is encrypted in, in the Azure and on the network and it's scalable. So if you're going to have a lot of more IoT devices coming up next year, really all you have to do is just change your plan and it will be scaled up. It can be scaled down. So in my uh, examples here, this is actually the pricing of Azure IoT Hub. And I'm using the free one because I don't really need that much. But as I said before, you know, you can scale up and scale down. That really depends on the size of the message you are trying to send and how many messages you are trying to send uh, per day. So depending on that, you can scale up and scale down uh, in IoT Hub easily. But sending the message is, well, half of the problem. What are you going to do with that message, right? There are all kinds of applications in Azure. You can create pipelines from Azure Hub to, for example, any of those. Uh, those are just a major one. There are more than that. But for example, event credit is for critical events. So let's say you have an IoT device in a car. It had a car accident. It's sending a message to IoT Hub. You want to do something, right? You can do this with the event grid, and you can kind of map that, and uh, you can handle that. You can have the logic apps, which is automating the business processes. You can do machine learning and you can add machine learning and AI models to your solution with that. Stream analytics is mostly for real-time analytics computations, so you can actually analyze your data real-time coming out from your IoT devices. 
So those those things are important because you know IoT Hub is useful. Azure gives you actually more uh, products to make it even more useful. If you go in IoT Hub though, you're going to see another term out there, which is Azure IoT Hub Edge. So what is Azure IoT Hub and what is the difference? Well, so in edge in computing, what really we are doing here is we are giving more responsibility to the IoT device. In regular IoT Hub, the message always sends to IoT Hub and maybe IoT Hub does something with it. But the message has to always you know, go on the network and send to IoT Hub for each message we want to send. In Azure IoT Hub, since we are giving some kind of responsibility to more IoT Hub, um, the, the device, the device can actually be more responsive. It doesn't have to wait for IoT Hub uh, to tell it do something. Also, you have less network calls. You don't have to send each messages to IoT Hub. If you know if the, if the device is capable to do something, it can do it without the sending the message. And you know, there is offline periods. It can be because of many problem, many things. And Azure IoT Hub Edge is more reliable in those offline periods because it can actually handle what's really happening. Uh, for Hub Edge to work, you kind of need to know about the containers because the applications actually run in IoT Hub Edge needs to run in containers and you kind of push them from the Azure IoT Hub Edge to the device uh, by the container. So you kind of need to know the containers here. So now I think what we learn is why IoT is important and I try to explain you what other technologies you kind of need to know. I think we are in a good place to talk about the SQL Edge. Now, uh, the first thing we need to know about the SQL Edge is right now currently it's, it's the SQL Server 2019 version, Linux version. If you look at the definition of SQL Edge, it says the latest version of SQL Server. So if we are going to have another SQL Server coming up later, probably that's going to be changed. So it's not going to be 2019 anymore. Uh, Microsoft recommends you to have Ubuntu 18.04 for the Linux version. And it doesn't, when I say SQL Edge, I think they remove the database from the main for the main reason because uh, they don't have like SSIS packages, SSRS packages, SSNS. It doesn't include any of those things. It has only the database engine in it. And also, it doesn't have the 100% either. For example, it doesn't have the in-memory tables. Uh, it doesn't have the file tables. And it, it, it's not 100% either. So uh, it, they just give you what you really need. It, there's no, like, it's not the full version of SQL Server. Uh, for it to run, you need a 64-bit process. And it can be x64 or ARM64. That's where the Raspberry Pi comes in. It needs at least one CPU and one gig memory. Whenever you actually fire up the SQL Edge from the container, you need at least 450 megabyte free memory for it to actually run without doing anything. So depending really what you are trying to do, you know, probably one gig is not a good idea, but you should have like four gig at least. And that can be it sounds 4 gig is not that bad, but if you have 10,000 IoT devices, that might be expensive because you are not really just talking about one device here. So you kind of need to you know, figure out that. Um, second one, uh, as I said before, the SQL Edge doesn't have all that information or all the features that other SQL uh, edition, SQL Server editions has, but it has that three items here that none of the other SQL Server editions has. The first one is SQL Streaming, and that is for really is based with the same engine that powers the Azure Stream Analytics. It just provides the real-time data streaming to IoT Hub in this case. Uh, the other one is the a T-SQL function, date bucket. I've never used it, so I'm not sure what it actually it does, but it's available only in SQL Edge. And also, it supports the Onyx runtime. Onyx is, I believe, is Open Mutual Network Exchange, 
and it's for the AI uh, modules. So you can actually push AI modules on this and it can actually learn and do something about things. Uh, the most, probably the common question I get is pricing. How much of this thing, right? So if you want to go pay as you go, it's like $10 per device per month. If you are going to have a reserve uh, for one year, you need to pay $100 per device a year. And for three years, it's much cheaper, a $60 device per year. So if you really think about it, it's really much cheaper than other editions of SQL Server, right? The first thing you need to know about it, this is only for one IoT device. So depending how many IoT devices, you are not really going to pay $100. If you have like thousands of it, for example, we are talking about $10,000, $100,000. And also, you, if you have the SQL Edge, you must use it for IoT uh, reason. It's not like you can just buy one SQL Edge, put an IoT device, and it will do other things that I guess not related to IoT. And billing actually starts when you push the SQL Edge from IoT Hub to your device. So if it fails or if it doesn't work, that doesn't matter that you are not going to pay for it. Microsoft will still charge you. So you want to be sure that everything is working fine because you are still going to pay for that. Now, uh, Azure SQL Edge, I'm kind of comparing that uh, with the pacifier. So IoT devices are really like babies, right? Babies, to communicate, they cry. And the problem with that with the analogy is IoT devices constantly communicate. So it's almost like constantly crying baby. And edge comparing is working just like the pacifier, right? So if you want to have some peace, you give the baby a pacifier and probably, you know, the baby hopefully is going to stop crying. So this is the same way with the uh, edge computing. So we have two versions of the specifier. And what really happens here is when you have the specifier, it keeps the device happy because you don't need to send the signal or the message constantly to the IoT hub because the specifier can actually handle it. And that will give you some peace to the device and that will give you peace to you. So you don't need to deal with, oh, what's going to happen if the network goes down or we go offline, what those IoT devices are going to do, right? So we have two versions of SQL Edge. The first one is for developers only, which uh, can handle the 32 gig memory, and it supports up to four cores CPU. Uh, in production, we have one option, which is gonna go up to 64 gig memory and eight cores of CPU. Right, so next one I'm gonna cover here is, well, I guess the application. This application, which actually makes IoT device, uh, Azure IoT Edge device, is the runtime. So runtime, um, we are going to be responsible to install this. In our case, I'm going to show you how to do that in Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's going to actually convert your device to, so it can actually connect to Azure IoT Hub. And with this device, with this uh, runtime, you're going to be able to manage all the modules. You are the, this uh, runtime is going to be responsible to, I guess, send the uh, report to module help. So if something is going on, it can send back to uh, IoT Hub. It's going to actually manage the com communications and security. It's going to get handled by the Edge runtime. Edge runtime uh, actually has two parts. Uh, the first part is the IoT Edge agent, which is responsible for all the, all the modules it's running. And it's going to be responsible for reporting all the statuses. If something is going wrong, it's going to be you know, responsible for that. And that's actually module itself. Uh, the second module is IoT Edge Hub. And it just works as a local proxy of the uh, Azure uh, Hub, IoT Hub. And it's not exactly the same copy, but this is the one which is going to communicate uh, the cloud is going to handle the authentication and it's going to connect uh, the Azure IoT Hub and send all the messages and receive the messages. So we have two parts that we kind of need to be familiar with. Now, I think we are ready to introduce you Raspberry Pi. 
So this is actually my Raspberry Pi when I bought it, and it came up with a couple of boxes here. And this thing looks very small, but if you look at the specifications, it's kind of crazy all it can do. Uh, I had the 4 gig RAM, and as you can see, it supports the 2.4 or 5 gig Wi-Fi, and it has four USB ports, and it has HDMI. Actually, believe it or not, I have two HDMI. You can connect to two, two monitors if you like. It's supposed to display for camera port and for storage you use the micro SD uh, cards, and it came up with Debian Linux 10 based operation system, which I really didn't care when I got that. But after I learn about more SQL Edge and I see that Microsoft suggests that I should have Ubuntu, that became kind of a problem. So what I did here is before I uh, tried to install anything, I say, OK, why don't I just get the Ubuntu and things will go much easier since Microsoft suggests that. So I went to uh, Ubuntu's website and all you can do is you can just uh, pick the, you know, the version and it will create a, a kind of like a micro SD card for you and you just put on it and everything is ready to go. So that was not the challenge. The challenge is when I say, OK, I want to go and check the version which Ubuntu I want, I see that 18.04 that Microsoft suggests is not the latest version. So I see that there are like two or three more major versions comes after 18.04. So it's almost like as a you know, computer guy, I don't want to get the 1804, I want to get the latest, right? Which I, I think it was the 2004 or something like that. I had no idea it was Ubuntu, so I just get that. So I thought it will work. So I'm going to continue that uh, story in a little bit. Uh, next, I have my Ubuntu machine. I have my Raspberry Pi. I'm in Windows. I really didn't want to put, I guess, one of my monitor on that HDMI port and kind of like waste my monitor. I say, why don't I just connect to this device from my Windows? It's much easier. I can actually take this device and put on my close to my router as long as it has a remote uh, and the, the wireless or the connected to a you know network. I can remote in. To do that, you need to use the open SSH uh, connectivity, or you can actually go and get third party tools if you like. The reason I'm showing this one is because actually, believe it or not, this is included in Windows. All you have to do is you have to just enable it. And to do that, uh, you can use the PowerShell. So what I did here is, here is my actual screen. I'm showing you the client version and server version. You don't need the server version. I'm just showing that actually it's there. All you have to do is you have to use the add Windows capability and you are saying this is the one you want, and this one actually adds OpenSSH client to your Windows machine. After you are done with this uh, installation, the next thing you have to do uh, is you want to be sure that that's going to actually run every time you run the computer. So the first thing I'm doing here is I'm just starting the service. Then I'm being sure that this is going to get run automatically every time it starts. Uh, third one here, I'm just checking the firewall. I want to be sure that nothing is getting blocked. And that's what kind of tells you nothing is actually blocking it's L. So those three things, after, after that, I am ready to actually connect to my Raspberry Pi from my Windows machine. To do that, this is the account uh, box from the Windows. I'm saying SSH. This Pi is the username that I want to use to connect the Raspberry Pi, and that's my IP address. After that, it asked me the password. And after that, I'm ready. As you can see in here, I am actually in the Raspberry Pi, and whatever I'm going to run here or the type here is going to run in Raspberry Pi, not in Windows anymore. So that gives me a lot of flexibility. I don't need to worry about connecting my you know, monitors anywhere. Is uh, the device actually stays with my router out there and it's always online, so I'm happy. Now, before we continue more about the installation, I want to actually talk about one more thing here. So, before you know, like any ARM uh, architecture, the only thing we had to worry about when we try to install an application, we want to be sure that this application is in 32 bit or 64 bit, right? 
because that's all we had to kind of worry about. But now we have the whole different CPU architecture here. And I'm talking about this because I made that this the mistake. Whenever you are trying to actually download anything for a Raspberry Pi, you want to be sure that the, the file you are downloading is actually made for the ARM architecture, 32-bit or 64-bit. So you really need to know your device. Because the problem is if you pick something wrong, it just doesn't really tell you uh, it doesn't tell you easily or a user friendly message says that, oh, you know what? This file you just downloaded is for AMD 64 and I have ARM 32, so this is not gonna work. I wish the error message was just like that, but it's not. So it took for, for forever for me to actually figure out what the message was. And at the end I figured out that, you know what? The architecture is, I downloaded the wrong file. That's why it doesn't wanna get, uh, start or run. So you want to be pay attention to architecture and you want to know the device that you are working with. So next is you want to know about one thing which is the containers because the IoT, the SQL Edge is going to come in container and you are going to be able to push that container from IoT Hub and your device is going to download it and start it and run it from there. So you kind of need to be, you know, uh, know that containers and know that technology. Now, uh, the second in which I'm going to do this in a way, there are two tiers when it comes to support to uh, SQL Edge. And those are, the first one is the tier one support. And this one is just tell you uh, which operation systems will uh, be working with the SQL Edge. If your um, operation system you are running is in this list, you're lucky. That means Microsoft supports you 100% and it's gonna be very easy for you to install SQL Edge and runtime to your device. So Microsoft is gonna actually give you almost all the command lines, all the repository of the software. So probably you're gonna run maybe three, four commands and you are good to go. As you can see, you want the 1804 is here, 1604 is here. My 2004 is not here. So that means I have a problem because I need to make this run manually. So, so hey Hassan, which version did you say you had? It was 20? 2004. 2004. Okay. Yeah. Oh, right at the bottom there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that's in the tier two support. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work, it works. So this one actually shows you that all those will work with the SQL Edge. All it just says that Microsoft is not giving you how to install this thing because maybe the system has changed or the dependencies are not in this uh, operation system. So you have to kind of manually go get all the dependencies, then install the package. So this is where actually my, I guess, adventure kind of starts because well, I try to go with this way, whatever they are telling me with 1804. But no, it just doesn't want to just work. So in my case, I'm here. And now let's start the actual installation. So what I'm going to actually show you here is this installation here is going to be for tier one and tier two. So let's start with the tier one first. So we are in Linux and I'm not a Linux guy, so I had to learn all of the stuff here uh, from scratch. So if you look at the documentation of Microsoft, how to actually install the runtime, which is gonna make your IoT device uh, and Azure Frame an IoT device. First, you have to go and download the prod list file for whichever uh, operation system you have. So in here, for example, if you use 1604, this is where it's located and CURL is standing for client URL and it's just an application in Linux that lets you download anything from internet. It can be HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SFTP, so you can download by using this uh, comment and all I'm saying is download this file from here and put it here. So that's all it does and this file has all the list of the repositories 
uh, software repositories that I'm going to need to install runtime. So that's all it has. Uh, next line, I am just copying this file that I just downloaded and I'm putting in this folder. And this folder has all the repositories that Linux actually checks whenever I try to install something. And sudo is, I think it's do a super user. So it's, this is almost like run as admin. So I am copying this file from this location to this location. So this one applies if you are in tier one. So this will be your first step to get uh, all the software repository from Microsoft. The next thing, we have to worry about the encryption. So for encryption, we are going to go and download this file from uh, Microsoft. And you are going to copy that uh, GPG file to this trusted GPG. This is a system folder in Linux. So all of the files are here. So this is going to be mostly for authentication and encryption. Uh, so you're going to need this. And this applies to tier one or tier two. And this shouldn't give you any problem. It's just like downloading the file and putting the file in the right place. That's all it is really. Now, third, we need to install a container system. So Linux can actually run these containers and check and install containers if it needs to. To do that, we are gonna go and actually this one, apt-get, this is like application package tool of Linux. And all it does is it's really look at the repository files, which, this is the one repository here. It has many of them like that. So when you click actually update, it goes and checks the repository to be sure that everything is updated, has the latest version. Then I'm going to install Mobi Engine. So Mobi Engine is an open source container system, and it's just like Docker, really. But with the Mobi Engine, you can actually config and you can make almost like own engine, whatever kind of makes sense to you. So there's like all kind of modules, you can create all kind of stuff with it. And it's open source, that means you don't have to pay for it. So everything is great. So after this is installed, as I said before, we had to get this uh, files, the config files. I'm still using the CURL here. I'm going to download this from this location. And then I'm gonna change its, uh, this is almost like, just change the access permission of the file so I can run it. And I'm just running the file here. So this should work for tier one, tier two. You shouldn't have any kind of problem here. Next, which is the last, uh, I guess, place. If you are in tier one, you are gonna get and install the IoT Edge. And as I said before, when you run the IoT Edge, if you don't have the first software repository I just showed you, this is gonna fail because IoT Edge, I don't know what IoT Edge is because Microsoft does not define where it is it. But if you're in tier one, if you're in Ubuntu 1604 or, 6, or 1804, this should work with no problem. And after you run this, you just need to restart the device and you should be good to go. That should be it. If you want a different IoT Edge uh, version, you can check the versions with list uh, A, and you can kind of see if you want to, I guess, install earlier version, you can do it this way. But as I said before, this applies only tier one. And from this point, you should be good to go. My case, I was not in this case. When I write this, it says IoT Edge, what is that? I don't know what it is. And I was like, okay, so what am I going to do now? Right. So what I find out why Ubuntu 1804 is in the tier one, but the latest versions are in tier two is for one big reason. Uh, the big reason is, uh, well, runtime needs SSL. And for Ubuntu, it's using this SSL file to make it available. In 1604 and 1804, the reference number here, you see Z1001, is upgraded. And in Ubuntu 1604 and 1804, this version was 10000. And 20 and later, that is 10001. So now, even you find the IoT Edge, it has dependency on this file. And it is looking specifically for 1.0.0.0. 0 .0. 
In my case, that file doesn't exist. So it was failing. So I have to actually go here and download 1.0.00. So it can actually look for look and find that file. So as I said before, when I was talking about the architecture, this is the same file. The only difference is, as you can see at the end of it, it just changes the, which architecture is that for. So you want to be sure that you are downloading the right file here and right architecture, whatever your IoT device has. So for me, it was ARM64, so I just download this one here. So this is the file. This is where the binary location is. So you kind of need to get this file. It sounds easy, right? If it's in Windows, you just right click, save as, you have the file. But I'm in Linux. So I need to do this in Linux and in command line. As I showed before, we had the C URL. Uh, so I'm going to use the C URL. I'm just going to put that in right here and I'm going to change its name to test. And this file is a dead file. So it's really, it's almost like a zip file, but it can actually install itself. It's like a Debian packages. And first thing I need to do, I download it, change its name to test. Then I am gonna run it as an admin. The package actually is almost like unzip and it's gonna just unzip and install the file. So as you can see, I do that, it unpacks it, it sets it up and I'm good to go. So at least I have the file that I needed for 1.0.0. That's that's the key, uh, I guess, version. So now nothing is actually stopping me to install IoT Edge runtime. The only thing stopping me, I don't know where it is because Microsoft is not giving me that information. So I don't know where am I gonna go and actually get this uh, first. So in here, this one just shows me how to install. I'm just using the app get install and I'm installing the libssl first. So after this point, I need to go and find the IoT Edge. And for that, believe it or not, it's on GitHub. You can go to GitHub and it's an open source and you can just download the latest version. And that's exactly what I did. I got the download from here i got the just like the this one here i get the url i use a c url i put the githubs the url here copy it then just install it just like the way that actually i was showing you for tier one because it was just saying apt get install iot edge now i know where iot edge is i know where it is so linux will actually install it this time when you run that, you are going to actually see it says Azure IoT Hub and IoT Edge. It says, here I am, and it's start to download. Now, after this completes, we are almost there, but we are not ready yet to, I guess, to make the call. Now, when this actually gets uh, finished, what's going to happen here is we need to be able to connect the IoT Hub. But how are we gonna do that? We don't even have a connection string. How is that gonna connect to my uh, IoT hub? To do that, after this kind of completes, you need to register your IoT device. In my case, I need to register my Raspberry Pi. There are three ways to do that. The first one is the Azure portal. You can just do it from there. VS Code has this extension, IoT tools extension. You can do from VS Code if you like VS Code. Or if you like the Azure CLI, you can get the IoT extension and do it from there. So I do from the Azure portal. It's much easier rather than downloading anything else. Uh, you can just go there and do that. So I'm going to show you how to do that. But you have to actually decide one more thing. What kind of authentication are we going to use here? So in my case, I'm just going to use a symmetric key, which is almost like the connection string that they are going to give me. I'm just going to put it in my uh, device and good to go. But if you are going production, probably you want to use a certification authentication, so it will be more, I guess, secure. So you kind of need to, you know, figure out which way you are going before you try to register your device. So in my case, I am going to symmetric key. Now, how are you going to do that? So when you go to Azure IoT Hub, first, first of all, you have to create the IoT Hub. It's just like creating any other service, right? It's just going to ask you to what your subscription is 
what's the name of the IoT hub you want to call it, and probably which region you want to use it, just like any other service. So there's nothing really special out there. But after you created it, so for example, I have my IoT hub named South Round Web IoT. So I am going under the IoT edge uh, of the tab here. Then you are going to actually see on the top, it says add an IoT edge device. So I just click on that. Then this window comes up. As you can see, it's asking me what authentication type I need. I'm just keeping the symmetric key because it's much easier for just get the connection string and just paste it there. And really, that's the only thing you kind of need to pick here, and you need to give a name for your device. Then from here, when you actually, uh, there's a button out there that says create, then you are going to actually see all this information you need for your IoT device to connect to IoT Hub. So in here, all I'm doing here is I am getting the primary connection string. I just copy it. Then I need to put that in my connection, the config file in Linux. That config file named config.yaml. And sudo, just again, I'm using as a uh, admin. Nano is the notepad of Linux. So what I'm really doing here is I am just opening this file in a notepad in Linux. This is the file. I need to find the connection string and just paste the connection string I got from the IoT hub. When this is completed, you just save your file. Then you are actually ready to restart your IoT Edge runtime. And to do that, you are just running this restart IoT Edge. And after that, you can just, if you want to check the status, what's really happening, if it's connecting or not, you can just run the status IoT Edge. And when you actually do that, you are going to see the following. Hopefully, you're going to see all kind of green messages. And as you can see, it's just checking if it can connect to Azure IoT Hub, if there's any kind of problems with it. So if you, I mean, I, this I did a couple of times. This was the, 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 I never had a problem here if I put the right connection string in the right place. So this one is telling us right now that we are in good shape. We can communicate the Azure IoT Hub, no problem. That doesn't mean that we have anything. We don't have SQL Edge. All we have is one device, IoT device, sending messages to IoT Hub. That's all we have. So now we are ready to actually push SQL Edge to this device. How do we do that? For that, we need to go back to IoT Hub and find our device. I name my device RASP4. And when you, this is the same place actually I get my connection string. So there's a button out there on top. It says the set modules. So that's where you're going to actually push the applications to do your device so it will run out there. So when you click on it, you are going to actually see a new window. So there are many options here. SQL Edge is located under the marketplace module. So you pick that. Then you are going to search. I search by SQL. As you can see, I see the developer. And this is the production probably. So I pick the Azure SQL Edge developer here, and I just click Next. So what really I just did is this is the module I want to push to my Raspberry Pi. Uh, to make the, I guess since this is going to be a module, it's a container. If you had experience, probably uh, you need to kind of define some of the passwords first so you can actually connect to your SQL Server. So you can kind of, those are kind of working the same way. They have the environment variables. You kind of need to define those first. If you don't define, it will still download the module, SQL Edge, but you cannot connect and it cannot start. So you might need to come back here and actually run the password. Then you'll uh, be able to kind of, I guess, install it. So as you can see, this is all you have to do to actually install the SQL Edge. Now, if I actually go, and it's going to say take some time because you're going to go and actually run and look at the IoT Edge list, and it's going to actually list all the running modules in your uh, Raspberry Pi. And this might take some time because it needs to download that first and it needs to install it. So it might take some time for you to kind of see it's running. If it's not running, you can still see it's not running and you can see an IoT Hub. But in this case, in my case, it was running totally fine. 
So now if I actually try to maybe show you what it looks like after it runs. Right now it's running. So let me actually try to connect to my Raspberry Pi. I'm using with uh, SSMS. And I go database engine. This is my IP address. This is SA. That's the password I just actually used in IoT Hub. So if I click connect, as you can connect, it's 150 as you can see. There should be no database. Actually, there's one database that I guess I created last time. As you can see, I have tables. It has even graph tables, which is great. And it looks like I have no tables here, so I can actually go and create a table. I'm doing this in right now Raspberry Pi. And well, if you don't like that, so you might need to actually do this way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say use sensors. And let's say I have oxygen sensor for whatever reason. And I can create a table. Let's see. You get this one here. Create table with say OT sensor. And I like let's say OT. City of Canyon County. Okay, I'll value. Did you? Sensor, maybe sensor ID. Take this ID. So if you actually run that, we should have our table. Refresh the table. As you can see, I had all these sensors here. So it just works the same way of uh, really the other SQL servers when it comes to creating stuff, updating stuff. So all I need right now here is probably maybe develop some kind of like a .NET Core application, push it here, which is going to actually get the data from my sensor and push it in this table. And also if I actually go and look at my IoT Hub, I can try that too. Let's see what it actually looks like there. So one minute, let me connect there. So you can actually see the messages coming in and going and it can it has a couple of kind of nice, uh, I guess, tools to show you how, how the traffic is going on. So, so let's try that. All right, so I have Sauron Web IoT here. That's my IoT hub. And if you go in here, you're going to be able to see in the overview that everything is running. And yes, you can see the messages. It looks like I'm sending 375 messages from that day to today. You can see that one device is connected. And those are kind of nice to see. Everything is working fine too because it's not really you don't know there's Raspberry Pi tells you running, but you can actually come here and see that everything is running fine. So in the last 30 days, as you can see, it's still sending messages. I never turn it off, so I don't know what kind of message it was sending anyway. And yeah, everything is here. You will see the IoT H hop here. Hey Hassan, question from James. I can take this as well if you want. So James uh, points out that this seems like a very time intensive process. What about Azure's IoT device provisioning service? Did you look at that in order to do it at scale? Any thoughts? Yeah, I haven't looked at that since all I was trying to do is actually make one run first, then actually look at that. But no, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at that. 
okay yeah i'll add that yeah that, that is a, a service to do this very automatically to register lots of devices um <laughs> automatically there is a, a feature to help with that okay, yeah since, since i was the first time i just want to really understand what's happening here before i try to kind of automate it i guess because you can do with the vs code too it's much you can just right click it give a name and it just starts there but I wasn't sure how to get the connection string from that and just install it because that's the only kind of problem I had because I had to still get to come here and get the connection string and paste to my IoT device. Yeah, yeah. Seeing seeing your your learning and your struggles is is very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your suffering with us. <laughs> yeah, it took some time, but now I'm in a place actually I can come and sit down and talk about it. So it's it's good. Yeah. It's good. You evidently learned a lot, <laughs> and we're yeah. learning a lot too. Yeah. And this was actually my last slot for me. This is the time that if you actually see the Azure SQL Edge is running, you should be in good shape. You are connected to Azure IoT Hub. Your Azure SQL Edge is uh, running in your IoT device, and it's ready to actually take data and do something with it. So, really, that was it. And that was my experience with IoT Edge. And it was, I learned a lot and I'm still learning. So my next thing I'm gonna do here is uh, probably create a very simple uh, .NET Core application. Maybe buy a couple of sensors and put in my Raspberry Pi and try to read data and push data to SQL Server. And let's see what else I can do from that point. So that's kind of my kind of next, I guess, project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can do a lot of uh, I've seen worked with customers who have done um, a number of things on the edge. You can do analytics on the edge uh, as well. It's another another use case you could look at uh, look at exploring. So it's uh, it is cool that you're, you're able to uh, yeah, run SQL Server on there as well to, to store at least some some local data. So that's cool. I'll see there. Don't have any questions. If anyone else has any questions they they want to ask Hassan, then uh, yeah, then now would be the time. Um, but uh, yeah, so so what was the the hardest part? You just type it in the Q and A. Anyone, if anyone has anything else to to ask. So what what was the toughest part, Hassan? What, what took you the longest? So the hardest part was a tier two part. I did not know that there was even tier two, uh, and there was no really documentation where to find IRTH files and lib SSL is dependency where to get that version is really looking for. And especially if I'm not a Linux guy, it's all challenge itself to actually do, you know install things in Linux. So that was probably the most time consuming part to actually learn Linux and be able to download stuff and install stuff in the right places. If you're in tier one, you are great because Microsoft actually gives you everything. But if you're in tier two, which I don't know because 2004, I think there's another version out there. Probably common than 1604 and 1804, I'm guessing, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, interesting. I understand I've climbed the, the Linux learning curve myself after being a Windows guy. Yeah, so so can relate. Uh, Ralph asked, uh, what device was Edge installed upon? Uh, I was a Raspberry Pi 4. Yeah, uh, so so yeah, that was so yeah. It took for, I think I've got a three. The four is relatively recent, right? That, was, that has a lot more oomph than the the Pi three that I've got. Yeah, yeah I think Pi the, three. Yeah. Oh, sorry, four. Sorry, four. Yeah, I think I had the four, and I got that. I think last summer I got it. It mm. took some time to kind of learn about it and change the operation system on it. So that was a challenge too. Okay. Um, so what are the most common real world uses use cases for SQL Edge? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, the works, I guess I, I can ask that, uh, answer some of that. I mean, I guess uh, if you uh, need to do some SQL like um, work uh, on the edge before you send it back up to Azure. So perhaps as part of uh, real time processing or something like that. So you want to do some some work, some analytics on data that is literally right by the because you know the use case for the edge uh, instead of just having IoT devices uh, thrown uh, their data straight up to um, the, the cloud up to the, the IoT 
um, a service in Azure, um, is that you've got a stopping point right right next to the sensors where you want to do some real something um, right very close to that source of the data. So I haven't come across uh, any customers yet who are using uh, SQL Edge in there. The, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, SQL Edge specifically. I've worked with lots of customers, particularly in oil and gas, who are using the Edge device that uh, Hassan was, uh, was showing, or the, 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 sorry, the, the platform, I should say, uh, not on um, Pi's, more, more on uh, industrial IoT devices from vendor, from the usual uh, IT vendors uh, like, like Dell, for example, um, uh, deploy those things out in the field in order to collect telemetry um, uh, and then bundle it up from a number of pads and then uh, send it um, together. We'll perhaps do some processing on it before it's, uh, it's sent up. Uh, to to Azure for you know further processing and uh, and such like, um, and there's been uh, so some run some custom code like Hassan was uh, suggesting and some custom Docker containers upon that raw telemetry as it comes on, and so as perhaps as part of that you know if you need some um, some static data perhaps or something like that then you could read those from SQL Edge. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What do you I think, think Hassan? Examples really I got from the product uh, managers are like especially even you don't analyze the data if the product that you are actually putting this in, let's say it can be a jet, it can go you know really remote areas or the ships going on the ocean and there's no wireless, there's no network to connect and you don't want to maybe use the cell phone because it's expensive to send the data. So this device actually can store the data until the device comes back then you can actually get the data and analyze what happened rather than you kind of lose the data. And because the I guess device was in a very kind of remote area, there was no connection to internet. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, entering the questions, uh, James points out that uh, you can run PowerShell 7 on that thing. Did you mess with that at all, Hassan? No, I have tried it. Okay, yeah, so FYI, yeah, PowerShell is open source and uh, across Linux now, so it's a bit of a shocker for a lot of Windows folks if they used yeah. to their PowerShell and then you can do that on Linux. That's sort of weird, but good to know. Thanks for calling that out, uh, James. Yes, that's a familiar world for those uh, making the, the, the climbing the Linux learning curve. Um, now there, so can the, can the cloud service manage or push code to run on the edge? Do you know Hassan? What was the question again? Can can you push manage or push code to run on the edge? So I think. So I am not sure. So I guess you can create your own container and push on the edge. Right. Right. But yep. Yeah. That's, that's, that. So I guess, and I think that would that would be the answer. Yeah. So um, you you have containers like like the one you showed there, Hassan, with uh, SQL Server. You'd have your own containers with uh, with your own custom code in it. And uh, I think you 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 intend to do a a .NET Core uh, perhaps uh, example. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that uh, yes, um, you can have. Um, uh, the Azure push those uh, to the to your IoT Edge device uh, from Azure DevOps and uh, update it and manage it, etc. Yep. That will be my second thing. So first, I will probably create the VS Code, be sure it runs on the Raspberry Pi, it pushes the data to SQL Server, and everything is good. Maybe I will just create a container from it, then push it. So it will run IoT yeah. Edge runtime. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Right. Good call, because that, that's you know one of the key use cases for, for Edge, of course, is is running that custom code on a device rather than like I was saying earlier, rather than uh, the traditional the original approach of, uh, of just ingressing data from IoT devices uh, from wherever they're sat directly up into up into Azure. Have something uh, running your own custom code right by the sensors so that you can. Uh, interact, maybe not send all the data, process the data, or even react to the sensors. Uh, perhaps you can get pretty pretty smart with it. Yeah. Um, so another question, is there bulk pricing for a large number of sensors? I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I think, so the, set, the, the sensors, I guess, are um, not, uh, 
part of this. I mean, that that's up to you, right? You would. Uh, yeah, I think your SQL Server cares. Yeah, SQL Server doesn't care. It, you can just plug whatever IoT device that you want in that thing, measuring whatever you want. So temperature, pressure, you know, flow rates, whatever the the uh, the sort of data, you know, light levels or um, video cameras, like you were showing there earlier, Hassan. Whatever the sensor can be, all kinds, um, and. Uh, uh, and then you hook it onto the IoT Edge, phys physically plug it in to the IoT Edge uh, hardware where your custom code on the IoT Edge receives that data and then gets it in, processes it, stores it in the SQL Server if you want, uh, runs some stored procs on it if you want, uh, deals with it, um, and then sends uh, stuff on up to uh, up to Azure if you want. That would be, uh, that would be how you'd... Uh, leverage the devices but that's yeah the devices that's up to you up to your up to your imagination whatever whatever you whatever you whatever you want um, knock yourself out <laughs> that's that's yeah. the power of iot yeah sql server is just going to take the data as data it doesn't care where it's coming from your application is the one which is going to get the data from sensor and push to sql server so well, the sql server is not going to care yeah. yeah okay uh no no other questions so all right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think it's uh, it's a wrap, Hassan. Really appreciate this. So, can we uh, post the deck to uh, the meetup, or if I if you give me the deck, we'll uh, sure. share it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for the attendees, uh, I'll uh, yeah, um, uh, post uh, the deck. I'll keep keep that up on the um uh, the, the comments to the to the meetup. So we'll we'll see that uh, up there. I'll work with Hassan to get that posted. For those of you who, who want to review the, the the stuff that he did, and you saw his contact information in there. Um, so yeah, many thanks, Hassan, for uh, coming oh. and talking to us uh, here in Houston. Uh, we've uh, now that we've defrosted. <laughs> appreciate you being flexible and uh, re re uh, rescheduling at the last minute, pretty much because uh, we're all so frozen last week it sucked <laughs> we hated yep. it we weren't happy but it's nice and warm here now so we're all in a much better mood so it's, it's great really appreciate that thank you <laughs> and this was this is interesting i learned a lot this, this is cool this is good lots of powerful use cases always good in fact my personal preference is to hear from members of the community of the community just folks who are you know doing this because they 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 want to or need to rather than uh, more more professionals uh, if you will so Particularly appreciate you giving up your time uh, and uh, talking to us uh, this evening. And uh, so many thanks. And thank you all to everyone uh, for uh, in Houston and Dallas. Uh, I saw, yeah, and perhaps uh, perhaps elsewhere for for joining us uh, this evening, giving your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will meet in person. Uh, I'm hoping may maybe this summer. What do you think? Um, I, I feel like the I'm end's in sight. I mean, okay. we're getting there. I feel like it. And there, there will be hugging. I'm just just uh, sharing that with you now, or at least uh, from me, you will get the offered the chance to do a lot of hugging. In fact, I've been thinking about it. You know those uh, Brazilian restaurants uh, where they have the little cards that like the beer mats and you know, a red and green. And if it's red, if it's green, they just bring loads of meat until you can't move, and then you. Have have to flip it to red okay we might do that in terms of hugs so if that thing is on green then you're gonna there's gonna be hugs on offer from me optional but you know that we, i'm thinking about something like that there's gonna be so much hugging so much hugging uh, optional but it'll be there so um, i'm looking forward to it it's gonna be good so we, we, we will get in person again and uh yeah life life will be so much better it really really will i miss it so much we will do that uh, in the meantime uh we'll, we're gonna stay virtual uh we actually have next month's uh scheduled uh, already got a speaker lined up so the uh, we're going to do um the azure spring cloud uh, technology if you don't know what that is if you haven't heard of it then you should come and uh, find out and uh, join us to see what that thing is a uh, set of uh, technology and infrastructure in azure for certain specific uh, use cases and we'll walk you through it in much the same way what it does how it uh, what it's for how to use it uh, etc we welcome questions and interaction once again so uh, thank you all for, for joining us uh, really, really appreciate your time and all, all of your questions uh, stay safe and uh, see you next month thank you everyone